started looking last class at regression and getting into some of the details on R squared, the analysis of variance table, and we were essentially looking at decomposing our regression into the sources of variability. So whenever you see a sum of squares term in any equation, so for example, anything raised to the power of 2, you're creating a deviation variable, deviation variable, deviation variable, squaring it and summing it, that's a variance. Okay, so whenever you see that in, in mathematics, the sum of squares, think of it as nothing more than a variance. A variance is we typically divide through by n, you divide through by degrees of freedom, but that, that's a constant that you're dividing through. So, this term over here, even though the sum of squares, once you divide it by the degrees of freedom, that's also a variance. Okay, I'm going to have it. So the square root of that thing is the standard deviation. So we're taking all the variance we start off with. This is our baseline. The total sum of squares can always be calculated on any data set. It's just simply y minus y bar, the mean. So this is, in fact, the variance of the y column. If you take a look at that formula, it's nothing more than the variance of your column of y data. And we're saying, well, if I start off with that variability in y, how can I decompose it into two parts? I can decompose it into the part I can explain, the regression, and the part I cannot explain, which is the residuals. So you're simply taking this variance and breaking it up into two portions. Ideally, you would love to explain everything in your data. So you want this regression sum of squares, the amount of variance you can explain with the model, to exceed the variance that's in the error. So you'd like the residual error to be small. And so when we construct this ratio, r squared, which is the ratio between the regression sum of squares, the part we can explain, divided by the initial variance we start off with in my raw data, the total sum of squares, we find that ratio to be large in some way. So we call this r squared number that ratio. It's a convenient name we give to that ratio. And under certain conditions, we can write that that's equal to the total sum of squares minus the residual sum of squares divided through by the total sum of squares. So RXS is my residual sum of squares. This is the portion we'd like to be small. We'd like RXS to be small. Total sum of squares is a constant. It's a fixed number that's totally dependent on the data set that you have on hand. Y minus y hat, sum of squares and blocks. So total sum of squares is a fixed large value. It doesn't really mean anything to talk about it. What, like, so it's just a fixed number. But what we ideally like is to have a small remaining residual so we get a large R squared. So we end the last class by showing that the R squared is from this ratio. And I ended up with this thought that shows you, and you proved it in the assignment that you will be handing in tomorrow, that R squared is the square of the correlation between X and Y. So if I simply take my raw data X and my raw data Y, calculate the correlation between it, square that value up, I get a number that is equal to R squared. So without building a linear model, you can get R squared. So the thought I left with you at the end of the class is to make the connection that, well, hang on, what is R squared really doing here? If R squared can be pre-calculated without building a linear model, what is the value of that number, really? So I can tell you what R squared is before I even build the linear model. It's a little counterintuitive. Why is this a number that's so widely used to evaluate linear models and statistics, yet it's so weird that I can compute it without actually building the model. So we're trying to use R squared as a way to judge whether our model is of any use based on the R squared number. The key point I want you to get from this course, one, there's about four or five key things I want you to remember after you graduate and work in your careers. This is one of them from this course, is that R squared is not the best metric to use to judge whether a model is of any value. What we're going to rather learn in today's class is a better alternative. So R squares are views, I would argue, as a way to measure how good is the model. So people sometimes say, well, R squared is 90%, this is a great model. We'll get to an example that shows R squared is in the order of 99% and it's a pretty useless model. 
Well, sometimes people say, well, that's a low R squared. That model can't be applied to it. That model can't be of any value. Well, I've worked with models where R squares of 40% have been worth a million, two, three million dollars of profitability in terms of understanding what's going on in the process. There's just so much residual noise in your raw data that it's making R squared small. So what I mean by that is residual noise, my, re my residual sum squares are so high, but my raw data itself was noisy and contaminated. My raw data in Y was very noisy to begin with. You cannot possibly build a model that has a high R squared. And in fact, I would argue if you do have a model with high R squared, you've built a model of the noise in the process. You've not built a model of the process. So coming back to the topic where I started off with here at the class is we want to take what my variance is in my data and break it down into two portions. The part I can explain with the regression model and the part I cannot explain. If my raw data is so contaminated with noise, this Y, it's a measured value on my process, my measurements have error in them. If that measurement error is so large, I'm going to get a very high total sum of squares here. If I build a model and I get a high R squared, all it says is all you've done is you've successfully built a model of the noise. So you've overfitted your model, you've added terms to your model, or you've done something with your model to essentially build a model of the noise in the process. You haven't really built a model of the process itself. So the analysis of variance table is a great way to understand what's the breakdown between what I can explain and what I cannot explain. We're going to get into the next few classes on more details on making this part that you can explain greater. We would ideally like this part to be well explained and have low residual standard uh, sum of squares. So we're going to get to that topic in, in a class or two from now. What I will also add up here is you'll see in, in uh, the R software output, you'll see this term called the adjusted R squared. This will become important to a few classes from now. The adjusted R squared is easily inflated. You can make the R squared value bigger by simply adding more terms to your model. So I'll just leave that thought with you. We're going to get to that in a few classes of what we mean by adding terms to the model. But for now, I just want to point out that I can inflate R squared by arbitrarily adding terms to the model. And that's no good either. So if R squared really isn't what we should be using, let's try to understand what might be a, a more suitable alternative. And that's the standard error. So the standard error is a great way to understand what's going on with the model and to really judge whether the model is of any value. The other ways you should be judging is, is actually try the model out. Does that parameter B0 and B1 that you've calculated, and it's usually the slope, B1, that's of interest to us, does that slope coefficient make physical sense to me? Make, make your judgment call based on actually interpreting the model parameter itself. And then here's the key way to assess whether a model is of any value, is to use the model on the testing totally new data. So one rule I, I have on my own work is I keep about 40% of the raw data aside for testing purposes afterwards. Build my model on about 60% of the data, screen for outliers, remove those, iterate a bit, and use 40% data that I've never touched and bring those and use the prediction error on the testing data. What I mean by that is let me take Y, y hat on my testing data set is equal to b0 plus b1 x test. So take a new data point x test that I've never used before and predict what y should be. But remember this comes from a data set which I've kept some of my data aside so I know y test itself. I know the true value of y that I should be getting and I compare it to y test predicted. Then what I form is the error, the testing error, which is y test minus y hat test. And I need to calculate the sum of squares of those testing values and calculate the variance of my errors on the test. <laughs> so I'm jumping ahead of myself here a bit, just pointing out though that what should be done to test the model is to use fresh data that you did not use when you built the model. 
So there's a bit of talk on the, uh, a bit of a demo on the course website on how you can do this in R. Um, and I'll also talk about it a bit more in some of the classes. What I'd like to get to now is this notion of a standard error and talk about what that means. So if we go back to our analysis of variance table, we had this term, the residual sum of squares. RSS is equal to the sum of squares of the residuals in the model. And then we divide through by the degrees of freedom, n minus k. So what do we mean by that? Let's take my error is equal to yi minus yi hat, every data point. I can then calculate the sum of these errors, squared, and divide through by the degrees of freedom. n is equal to my number of data points. And k is equal to 2, because we fitted two parameters, m0 and m1. So the denominator is a constant term. It's n minus k, it's a constant value. The numerator here is the sum of squares of my residuals. This we call standard error squared. And that's also equal to the residual sum of squares. So if I look back at my analysis of various table, RSS is the sum of squares of the residuals, which is the sum of squares of y minus y hat, observed minus predicted, divided by n minus k of the standard error. So let's take an example to help understand and interpret what, what standard error is, is, is talking about. Let's assume my model is to predict the yield from a batch. And x, the variable that I'm using to make that prediction, is the purity of the raw material that's going into the batch. So, I would like in the future to predict what the yield is going to be given an analysis from my lab. I get a lab value that tells me what my raw material purity is. I'm going to predict what the yield is going to be for the batch. Let's say I get a standard error from the model. So the square root is of SE squared. So SE squared is a variance, it's a standard error squared. Not very interpretable. Square root of that, it now has units of x or y. Units of standard error. So that's the first important point. It has the units of y. It has the units of a variable that really matters to us. Here, in this case, the yield from the batch in kilograms. I really do want to know what that batch yield is going to be in kilograms. So y minus y hat is going to have units of kilograms. That's this term over here, the error. y minus y hat. I take the sum of squares of those, take the square root of it. My units for standard error in this case is going to be kilograms. So what does the standard error of 3.4 kilograms mean? So, SE had the value of 3.4 kilograms. How do I interpret what that means? This is, a, this is one of the important outputs you get from R. So what, one way you can see this is, if I assume my errors, those E's that I'm using here to calculate standard error, if I assume that those errors are normally distributed, by that I mean if I had to draw them as a distribution, and <coughs> The center of that distribution is going to be at zero. Remember that that's one of the objectives of the least squares model, is that the estimated, or sorry, I should say the expected value of the errors is zero. So the mean of the errors is zero. So a histogram of EI is going to be centered at zero. Standard error then can be interpreted as the one sigma deviation from the mean. In other words, it's the one standard deviation from zero. That would imply then that a range of plus or minus sigma around zero 
So from minus 3.4 to plus 3.4 in this case, this range <coughs> contains 70% of my residuals will lie within that range. Will lie within plus or minus one standard error. If my residuals are normally distributed, and many times they are, so it's very easy to check that. We do a QQ plot of my residuals, I can check whether they're normally distributed. This tells me right away that part of, I'm sorry, 70% of my model errors lie within plus or minus 3.4 kilograms. Now, I have an intuitive understanding of what that shield might mean in my process. Maybe, let's assume that the average batch shield for my process is in the order of 50 kilograms. So a prediction error of between minus 3.4 and plus 4, y minus y hat, that's what the EI is saying, y minus y hat, this is telling me that 70% of my predictions are within this range from minus 3.4 to plus 3.4, around the average batch yield. So roughly about two-thirds to 70%. About 95% of my predictions will fall within plus or minus two standard errors. So a standard error is the standard deviation of your residuals, is what it comes down to. A far more useful way to judge whether a model is actually working for you, because for the main reason that it's in the units of the variable that we're interested in predicting. That's the key, key reason why standard error works so well, because it's in very interpretable units. Provided, provided we have this normal, normal distribution on the on residuals. Okay. Now, I do also just want to point out, to make you, to complete the picture, that using R squared isn't totally meaningless. You may have got that impression from last class with my strong statements on R squared, but I did want to just tie it all together and make it a bit more balanced. Okay, and again, this is not something I've seen in a regular textbook, so let's just uh, let's take this down here. I don't think I've updated my, uh, my PIG book yet either with this. So let's just go back to our definition for standard error. It's the sum of squares of the residuals divided through by the degrees of freedom. Or another way of saying that is why I minus Y hat. But we also have that standard error is equal to the residual sum of squares over N minus K. So but all these statements up here on the board are saying essentially the same thing, just a different notation. Now, we also have that R squared is equal to the total sum of squares minus the residual sum of squares divided by the total sum of squares. <clears throat> if I take a look at that statement, I can actually rewrite it a little differently. I can write it as the residual sum of squares is equal to the total sum of squares 1 minus R squared. Just with a bit of algebraic manipulation. and I think you can see where I'm going with this, is if I substitute this definition of residual sum of squares in over here, I get total sum of squares, 1 minus r squared, divided through by n minus k. So a very simple derivation here is quickly showing you the link between r squared, something you're comfortable with, and the standard error <coughs> squared, which is this new concept we've just introduced has nothing more than the variance of my residuals, or the square root of that being the standard error, the standard deviation of my residuals. And now you can see the very clear link. If I can make r squared, if I can increase r squared, then the standard error drops. If I can make r squared larger and closer and closer to 1, I can make my standard error smaller and smaller. 
and vice versa. So if I can decrease standard error, then R squared goes up. So this ties in with our discussion over here of what is the standard error. I'm saying here that by increasing R squared, that's a notion that you're probably comfortable with, is how can I make R squared larger, it's more desirable to have a larger R squared. That means that automatically by doing that, standard error will go down. It's, it's very clear that that will happen because total sum of squares is a fixed constant. N minus K, a fixed constant. So the only things that change is R squared goes up, standard error goes down, or the other way around. These other two terms are fixed. Once I have a given data set, total sum of squares is fixed. For a given data set, N minus K is fixed. So by increasing R squared, your standard error goes down. That's implying that your histogram for your residuals will narrow up. So you now get a smaller standard error. So for a higher R squared, you get a, a narrowing histogram on the residuals. Okay, so it's not as bad as I made it sound in the last class that R squared is totally garbage and useless. There is a more balanced view here that the standard error and R squared are very strongly related to each other through that equation up there. Which is why I'm surprised I don't see this in regular stats books because it's such a simple derivation. Now, still, I encourage you to transition your mind to working with standard errors rather than R squares. You will still have to deal with colleagues in the future that have been trained and yourself and been trained to use R squares as one guide to judge the model. But I will argue that standard error is more intuitive, especially when you have this view of it as being the standard deviation of your residuals. And furthermore, the fact that it's in the original units of the variable you care about makes it even more powerful. R squared is a dimensionless number. So it's very little, it's very hard to say to someone, well, I've gone from R squared of 60% to 70%. So what does that extra 10% do for you? What has that done for your model? How has it really improved things for you? You can't tell. Standard error by saying to someone, well, you know what, I've managed to make my prediction on the model go from a standard error of 3.4 down to 1.7 kilograms. You can very quickly see the improvement there. You've more than halved it, or you've roughly halved it, I should say, and the fact that it's in the original units means that I can, in my mind, see, well, you know what, hang on, my normal Y bar is in the order of 50 kilograms. So now to get a prediction that plus or minus 1.7 is pretty, pretty powerful compared to the original value of 3.4. So for those reasons, I would encourage you to mentally move over to using standard error. And uh, we'll, we'll start to see um, a few examples of that come out. Now, where I'm heading in today's class, uh, or this next section, I should say, is we're going to also want to build confidence intervals for our regression parameters, E0 and E1. So, quick recap of confidence intervals here. <coughs> what we're going to head towards is finding bounds. So, confidence intervals, we call, are all about lower bounds and upper bounds. <coughs> we're going to try and find lower bounds and upper bounds for beta 0 and beta 1. So I'd like to say beta 0 lies between some lower bound and some upper bound. And I'd like to say beta 1 lies between some upper bound and some lower bound. These are the true population parameters. Beta 0 and beta 1 are unknown. What we do is we say E0 is equal to an estimate of beta 0, and B1 is an estimate of beta 1. That's the best we can do. We can take a data set and estimate what that parameter is. What I still want to find is, I want to find lower bounds and upper bounds for each one of those parameters, so I can make a judgment call on the <coughs> sensitivity of my model. Remember, when we look back at confidence intervals, we considered things like whether it spans zero or not. We, we looked at the engineering judgment. 
we're going to do exactly the same for this. Now, if you remember the construction for a confidence interval, we required to make a few assumptions. We create a Z value. So if I had to look at the V1 case, we're going to say V1 minus beta 1. So a Z value, we always create this deviation in the numerator. And then we divide it through by the variance in the denominator. Squared. And we said that those lay between upper and lower critical values. So if you think back on, to, on confidence intervals, our whole procedure in confidence intervals was to find CT, that's the critical value from the T distribution. We divide through by a variance, square root of the variance, and we subtract off the population parameter that we want. The big issue we face here is what is this term in the denominator? we can derive an estimate for this variance. We will never know the true variance for beta 1. Okay? So we never will know the population variance. We will estimate this from the data, and then we'll say that we'll use the t distribution means because we've made an estimate of this variance. Now, the, the derivation for this, really messy. And if we were in a stats course in third or fourth year, we would go through it. But it's pretty boring. A whole lot of algebra. But there are several assumptions along the way. So we will not go through the derivation. What we will go through, however, are some of the assumptions. We'll go through them fairly quickly because I will come back to them in a later class and we'll, we'll start to understand a bit more what each assumption is. <coughs> but for now, I'll simply go through them. and. Um, in the course textbook, there's a little bit more discussion on each one. But again, later on in the course textbook, there's a lot more discussion on where each assumption works and doesn't work. So let's just work through them fairly quickly. And many of them you've probably <coughs> seen before or make, make intuitive sense to you. The first assumption we require is to say we're dealing with a linear model. Well, y is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 x plus an error. That is re a required assumption. It seems pretty obvious. So we're assuming our model is linear. What that means is that this error term over here is the error of y. Okay, so some, some students confuse this error over here, thinking it belongs to the x. No, this error over here belongs to the y. It's the error in y, not in, not in x. What the, this assumption leads to is the implication that your x variable has no, has no uncertainty than y. So whatever I'm using to make a prediction of y should have no uncertainty. y can have error, and we expect our y variable to have error, but the variable I'm using to make a prediction from x should not have any error. So when this comes back here to this lab, let's go back to this lab example, I was predicting that shield, that has error. And I, I measure that and there's some uncertainty in that measurement. The variable I'm using to make the prediction from is the raw material purity. What that assumption requires me to say is that I'm able to measure that raw material purity with, now, with no error. That may not always be true. So bear that assumption in mind. Many times in engineering situations, our X's that we're using to make the prediction actually do have error. The assumptions, though, for least squares modeling require that to be error-free. Error so it's not always meant. But in many cases, the error in X is lower than the error in Y. So, so that's at least somewhat comforting. The next assumption we have to make is that my variability of Y at a given x is constant. And that variability is constant at every value of x. So it's a bit of an mouthful, but let's try to deconstruct it visually. Here's my regression line in red. So that's the regression line I'm, I'm going to fit, the linear model. On this axis here, I've got x. On this axis into the page, I've got y. Take a value of x, x1, for example. If I make repeated measurements of y at that value of x. Let's say x is a temperature, and I'm using the temperature to predict the viscosity y. 
So I go to my lab, set the equipment at x1 to that temperature, and I take repeated measurements of the viscosity y. I will get a distribution of viscosity values, shown there in blue. Now if I go shift my equipment up to a different temperature, and again go measure various values of viscosity, over and over and over, I should get a distribution of viscosity values that has the same degree of variability of deviation then as it has at other temperatures. So this standard deviation of the y variable must be the same at all values of x. So the variance of y is constant at all values of x. And again, in many engineering situations, this does not hold. Often as we go to higher temperatures, for example, I get greater and greater variability because my equipment may not be able to work so well in one zone as it does in another. I may get far more consistent data in, at lower temperatures than I do at higher temperatures. So again, this assumption is often violated. Only way you can check it is by doing repeat measurements, duplicate me uh, multiple measurements, I should say, at, at individual values of x's. The next assumption we have to make is that my residuals are normally distributed around the mean of zero with a certain standard deviation. Again, not always certain that this holds in, in many cases, but it's very easy to check. You can simply take a QQ plot of your residuals and see that they're normally distributed. Okay, so here's an example. On the left-hand side is my model, x equals <coughs> to predict y. Looks like a pretty good regression model over here. I've got a fair, fair consistency with that, with that model. But if I look at the residuals, the QQ plot shows I've got some significant outliers over here that are not normal. I've got a heavy tail of outliers. And over here as well. So in this case, that assumption is actually violated. So the assumption of normal distributed residuals holds for the majority of the data, but there's a good number of data points where that assumption is not, not valid. So we're, what I'm just, I won't focus on the implication of violating this assumption yet. We're going to get to that in, in a few classes from now. We're first just simply stating what the assumptions are and visualizing what that assumption might look like. Here's another one, that each error is independent of the other. So every EI value is totally unrelated to the other EI values. Very often violated in engineering and chemical engineering processes, particularly on a process where you're taking data and the process is slow. So if I take data very frequently on a slow moving process, if I get a large residual now, I'm going to get a large residual a few seconds from now and again a large positive residual a few seconds from now. So what that comes down to is the fact that our processes are very highly autocorrelated. And I will show a test for that in a, in a, in a Let's visualize that again. Here's my raw data, Y. So it's a slow moving process. Uh, here where it's operating below the mean, it stays there for a while, and then it moves above, then it moves below. It's not independent. There's a very strong relationship between successive data points. When I plot a regression model of x against that y variable, again, I seem to have a, a reasonable regression model over here. I've got some spread for sure. But then, very interesting how we can verify that assumption that the residuals are independent of each other is to plot a time order plot of those residuals. So in sequence order, I show what those residuals look like, and I can very clearly see that my residuals are not independent of each other. There's a whole sequence of residuals where they're all in the region of about minus five. So you cannot say that this residual is independent of the next one. The next one. It's a very strong relationship amongst those residuals in that, in that regard. Next assumption is that you assume that x's are fixed and independent of the error. Okay, so there's really two parts here. My x values are fixed. They're, they're, there's no error in them. That's very similar to our first assumption. But also here, importantly, that my errors are unrelated to the x's. Okay, now, this comes and is tied quite strongly to this, this figure over here. 
That histogram over there is a representation of my residuals because I've, I've shown this histogram along my regression line. So here, if I saw that at high values of x, that histogram was wider apart, I cannot say that my errors are independent of x. If I was getting large distribution at high values of x and narrow distribution at low values of x, I'm violating that, that, that assumption. So that, that assumption up here says my errors are independent of x or x are independent of the errors is, is not going to hold. And the only way I can verify that again is by multiple data points at the same value of x. And checking that that variance is staying in the same, it's not related to the other. And the final assumption we need to make is that my y data points are independent of each other. So every yi value is unrelated to the other. Again, very easily violated when you're taking data on the process where the process is moving really pretty slow. So what that all comes down to, those six assumptions that I, I went through pretty quickly, is if those assumptions hold, then we can construct confidence intervals for B0 and B1. Okay. So I have to make those assumptions, and those assumptions may not seem why, why do we need them, but if we go through the, the pretty lengthy derivation mathematically for constructing this confidence interval, each one of those six assumptions gets pulled in at some point or another in order to get to where this slide starts. Okay, so we don't really go into the use of those assumptions, but they are needed in order to construct this confidence interval. So constructing a confidence interval, we say, well, beta 1, oh, sorry, I should say B1, is normally distributed around the beta 1 population value with a certain variability B through 1. So this is back to the regular confidence interval idea where we said x is distributed normally around some mean mu with a given variance. Here I'm doing exactly the same thing. Then B1 is normally distributed around a center value beta 1 with a certain variance. And the same for B0. So what we do then is I will take that we'll take that variance and we'll use that in the denominator and, and create that confidence into it. So if I have that variable that variance term, I can I can I can do the confidence interval pretty quickly after that. The derivation for that variance is the messy part. So that's the part we won't go through. What I will do, however, is just use the result that is derived in those four. So if you go through those, let's, uh, let's assume we, we understand how this is calculated. Let's go ahead then and, and calculate the confidence interval. So we need several things. We need this variance of the residuals. We called that standard error squared earlier on. I need the variance of V1. And in the notes is the derivation for that. The variance of E1 is equal to the standard error divided by this denominator, so xj minus the average of x squared. Okay, so here again, notice I, I said at the start of the class, every time you see a sum of squares, immediately your brain must think, this is a variance. This denominator here is the variance of your x data, x minus x bar squared take the sum of that. So this numerator term is proportional to the variance of x. So the variance of b1, by how much error you're going to have in your estimate of the slope coefficient b1, is related to two variances. The variance of your residuals divided by the variance of your raw data. What do we want from our confidence intervals? Do we want wide confidence intervals, narrow confidence intervals, confidence intervals that span zero, that don't span zero? What is it that we're looking for in a confidence interval? So I agree with your notion of, of a narrow confidence interval. For beta 1, 
Would you want that split to span zero? Mm. So would you want this lower bound and upper bound beta one to span zero? I guess it depends on what you're trying to answer with the with the regression model that you're building. Typically, we want that interval certainly to be narrow. Absolutely agree with that. Whether you want it to span zero or not depends on, on what your interpretation is going to be of the model. Sometimes I want to build a regression model that sees whether a certain x is related to y, and if I want to prove to myself that that x is unrelated to y, I hope to see an interval that does span zero. If I want to prove that that x actually is related to y, I hope to see an interval that does not span zero. But certainly no matter what my model is that I'm building, one thing that is key is that this confidence interval is narrow. So as narrow as possible. And one way you can make that confidence interval narrow is by having a small variance of this term here. So whatever this variance is over here, so we've got our values distributed among uh, around some average with a certain variance. The narrower, uh, sorry, the smaller that variance is, the narrower your confidence interval. So we do want this to be small. The variability in beta 1 must be small. So if we look at that, the variability of E1, if I want to make that small, it's telling me I can do two things. I can make the numerator small or I can make the denominator large. Making the numerator as small is something we've already addressed. We know that we want our standard error to be small. How can I make the data error, how can I make the denominator large? <laughs> Denominator large, you want the large variability of x in your x data. xj minus x bar needs to be as big as you can make it. What that is in English is to say, make sure that your data points are spread far apart on your x axis. So sample as widely as you can on your x scale and you'll get the narrower variance. And that, that advice makes, makes some intuitive sense. If you consider regression models that you may have built in the past, so if you continue on with this example of trying to predict, of trying to predict viscosity from temperature, it says make sure I sample over as wide a temperature range as possible. So sometimes people will sample the data, say only over a narrow region and build a regression model over a very small region. But it says that if I want to reduce the variability of my estimate, I should go to larger larger ranges on my x-axis. So widen up that range as much as possible. Certainly though, there's a balance to be struck. You don't want to make that x range so wide that you start moving into regions that you would never actually operate your process in. So you, you choose values here on this axis that span typical operation and a bit more. Okay, but you certainly don't go to excess. So that's that's some good good in, interpretation that we get from this confidence interval and, and understanding it. So variance of B0 is a, is a messier term. Um, but what I do want to point out is that in both instances, they're very strong functions of the standard error. So here again, just for that simple reason, it's important to understand what standard error is doing because it, it, it comes so often into the understanding of your least squares model. So the variance of beta 1 and the variance of b0, the slope and the intercept, are both very, very strongly related to the standard error um, in both instances over here. So we've got these three three terms, these three variances, the variance of beta 0, variance of beta 1, and the variance of my uh, residual data. Notice here I've said the variance of y is equal to the variance of e. And that comes from that prior assumption that my model is fixed, and that the variance of the errors are will also then in, implicitly become the variance of, of y. So if we come back to my instruction for a confidence interval, let's take the case of B0 here, take B0 minus the population data 0, divided through by the square root of the variance. That, notice here, I'm calling this the standard error of B0. It's the square of the variance 
of B0. So the variance of B0 can also be written as the standard error of B0 squared. If I take the square root of that, I get S subscript E B0. And I have the same for B1. So that's where this notation is in the denominator. It's the square root of the variance of B0. And that must lie between the critical values given by the T distribution. The T distribution is being used because we do not know the population variance will be zero. We do not know the population variance will be one. We're using estimates of those two variances, and because of that estimation procedure, I lie within the upper and lower critical values given by the t-distribution. So I can then unpack that in the usual way and find my lower bound and find my upper bound. It will be zero, lower bound, and upper bound will be one. The only remaining question is, what is that CT value? So CT is the critical value from the T distribution. We need to choose a certain level of confidence for that. So I choose, say, 95%. But I also need to know the degrees of freedom. The T distribution requires some estimate of the degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom here is N minus K. So the number of degrees of freedom that I look up on in R or on your data, on your table, in an exam or in your software, is you say in R, you would say something along, if I wanted the 95% confidence interval, you would say QT 0 0.975 N minus K. This is for the 95% confidence. So 95% so confidence, 2.5% in the left tail, 2.5% in the right tail. So the appropriate command to use in R to find that value of CT is QT, 0.975, N minus K degrees of freedom. So we've got only two minutes left. So I won't go through this example, but let's say, let's do the following. This um, example is, I will cover it in the next class, but it's, it's very easy actually. If you go right back in your slides, the raw data for this example is this table over here. There's x, there's y, and you could work through those calculations for the confidence interval and, and verify for yourself that you can duplicate the values in the slides. But I will cover it in the next class. What I will cover in the next class is actually show you how to do it in R. I won't go through the calculations. Okay. We won't do it in R.